Hey everyone, my name is Gygus. And I'm Heron. And welcome back to Campfire Embers. Take Today, three? Take three, yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulties with uh, feedback, but... Yep. When, when, when are we ever going to have a normal intro? It, it, this podcast is cursed, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so, Flaming Gnomes, that's today's topic. Yeah, so... Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for everyone when I say this. Uh huh. <laughs> um. So we're talking about D and D today. If that wasn't clear, hopefully it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the whole flaming gnome thing is uh. Is something we'll get into very, later. <laughs> yeah, very interesting um campaign that that uh, me and uh Heron took part of. Um, but yeah, so this is. Something I wanted to talk about. Um, this is mostly going to be me um, speaking today as uh, Heron kind of took the spotlight last episode with Nintendo stuff. I, I, I'm sorry. You let me talk about Nintendo. That's your fault. In all fairness, I was very tired that day. I'm, I'm still <laughs> very tired. I am. You've been up since, what, three in the morning? Yeah. Well, have fun talking. Here we go. <laughs> so... Um, those of you that don't know, I, I have talked about this a little bit on the channel. Um, I am a DM almost, uh, about two years now. Been going strong for about two years. I started when I was 18. I have come from a family who didn't really let me play D and D. So as soon as I hit 18, I, I became a DM because I wanted to play D and D. So that would be sometimes. And I mean... I had played a little bit of D&D uh, when I first got to high school because uh, me and my sister started getting into it uh, around the end of my freshman year. And uh, she found a, a, a party um, that let me join in their campaign a little late. So that was pretty cool of them. Yeah, so my experience with D&D is literally one, maybe two sessions of me playing a Dragonborn Paladin um, going into... Um, Oathbreaker, mm -hmm. and yeah, like I said, lasted two sessions, and nothing ever happened again. So I was just like, okay, well, I don't have very many friends who <laughs> are free to play D and D for several hours. So I want to learn how to run my own and build my own um my own campaign essentially yep, your own worlds your own mechanics your own lots of things and let's just say it did not turn out very good the very first uh session because i did not know how to dm a game it was at least you had me who had at least some experience playing dnd &D. no it was it was it was just bad because <laughs> I, I had you guys uh, start off with nothing, and your um, your unarmed attack, which should be a flat, um, I believe four damage. I made you roll a d4 for. Yeah, that was. <laughs> so sometimes was you would just do one hit point and took a very easy encounter, an hour. Yep. So let's get. Better be glad that I actually know my stuff now. Yeah, because granted, we still have we still have problems with with combat, but they're they're, they're problems that are supposed to happen. Yes, very like <laughs> specific stuff that uh, a lot of people wouldn't typically know right off of their head. Nope. Um. So yeah, I played uh, several different campaigns. My first one being a complete homebrew. Um. Second one, also being a complete um, homebrew. But by your design. Well, both are. But um, the second one is actually one that we're still doing to right now. Um, yep. It's called, um, I've named it Tower of Azeroth, which is uh, kind of like inspired by a bunch of different things. Mostly like uh, SAO and like, uh, solo leveling and stuff like that. Ready player one's got some elements in there. Yeah. It, essentially like you get like 
you die and then you awaken in this other world and you have to climb to the top of the tower to be able to like free yourself and you have to do a bunch of different quests and stuff to reach the next level and i've i'm pretty much implementing an entirely new xp system and uh balancing things because i want to bring um the level cap up from 20 to i think 60 yeah, because you want to do um, homebrewed, uh, homebrewed evolved classes, like ascension yeah. classes for each level, and even going into like merge classes with um, if you decide to do like um, multi classing and stuff. So it's a lot of a lot of trial and error because I want I don't want to make it broken, but at the same time like um, make it fun. Yeah. And it, it's been great so far. I've been enjoying it since the get-go. Yeah, and we've been going for almost a year now, I think. Yep, and the best part about that is we're still on the first floor. The first floor, yeah. <laughs> Out of a hundred. Yep. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of how uh, how often we're meeting, we are playing every week. Yeah, Usually it's been... three or four hours if we can do it. Yeah, we've we've taken a couple months off because we decided to start Curse of Strahd, which is actually going really well because this is something that we started um, August, so I had quite a bit of uh, DM DMing experience going into this. I'm not an experienced DM by all means. I'm like I said, I've only been DMing for two years, but um, I have a lot of experience with, I mean, running my own campaign and having to learn everything. So yeah, and I mean you. You're starting to build up your uh, your cyber collection of books and yes. things as well. I have a lot of books. Yeah, you're doing great. I mean, all I every time I play one of your planned out sessions, it um, obviously ninety percent of the time it goes off the rails because that's D and D. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, but every everything is so methodically like just put together. I can tell you worked on it. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that's not always the case with some written campaigns. Yeah, so I. I believe I spend at le- a minimum of four hours for every session, and that's bare minimum. I know for a fact I spend longer than that on our sessions because I I make all the maps myself, um, all the encounters, all the story aspects. It's its its own, like, its own little world inside of a world, so... <laughs> I still think my favorite thing about it is the fact that we fought an owl bear when we were less than I think we were level three at that time. Yeah. So that was fun. <laughs> I still don't know how we managed to kill that thing. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, you also um, you guys tamed a a black wormling. You were not supposed to, but nope. you did it somehow. Um, Look at the draw. That's how that works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so going into my um, future plans with um, Ember's Corner and D and D, I would, I personally want to bring D and D as our fourth leg, being um, com- kind of completing the the table here, mm-hmm. uh, gaming or podcast, uh, music eventually, and then and then D and D being our fourth leg, and then eventually. Um, br- branching out into some other things. I know we want to experiment with maybe animation and story writing uh, later down the road, like very far in the future. But yeah, We have some mystery content that we're still in the very, 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 I mean, very beginning process. Who knows? <laughs> we can even turn our, um, our stories of D&D into animations and have that uh, its own, like, movie kind of thing. Absolutely. It's, uh, there's a lot of... There's a lot that goes into just playing a game, and it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so this is probably going to be a little while down the down the line with uh, personal things going on and uh, timing, scheduling conflicts and things. But um, I'm – for our first D&D um, campaign, I am completely rewriting my first ever campaign. Uh, campaign which the coolest part about i was the i was your beta tester for that yes campaign. you were my beta tester and <laughs> it went through a lot of iterations and fine tuning and everything and it was 
the story itself is good but needs a lot of reworking now that I have a lot more experience with DMing and how to make a world and, and campaign and stuff like that. So I'm essentially keeping the base story and rewriting everything so it fits better. It it feels a lot more like interactive and feels like you're in the in the story and I'm hoping that um you guys will enjoy that as well. Um I I still think one of my favorite uh just to give you guys a uh, a little bit of a uh what's the word uh, <laughs> just to give you guys a little uh i guess perspective on how much guy gets puts into all of his D D stuff one of my favorite sessions of tower of azeroth was uh we had uh we had five we had four players at the time unfortunately our party has been cut since then <laughs> <laughs> but that's due to life stuff and it happens um i just i i, I love that because um how he wrote it out was we had to have um throughout the first floor there are these three key fragments that you have to fight bosses for that you have to connect in order to even access the tower um uh to to progress through it and um he's written uh backstories for each of the characters um in uh <laughs> in tower of azeroth um because uh of how uh, we we woke up and yeah because you essentially like don't remember who you are and uh what what you how you ever got there mm -hmm. you have the memories of your past life but in terms of who you are in this life you have no recollection of exactly. and so bringing that into a backstory and having the characters physically figure out who they were and how they fit into this world brings a entirely different light on D and D that a lot of players don't like experience because they already know their characters and their backstories because they get to write it themselves. Yep. And I essentially kind of, um, took that away because even before we started this campaign, we, I made you guys roll for everything, your race, your class, like your stats, everything. Mm -hmm. So it would be completely, foreign to you yeah. and then i built you a character in a background um based off of that so it's an entirely different way of playing and i really feel like that brings more to your character because you're trying to learn who you are exactly and i love it because uh so when i play D D, 90 percent of the time i'm playing i play a rogue it's my <laughs> it's my comfort class <laughs> if you will just because i i know how to play them well and I've always thought they were the coolest. And go figure, you rolled a rogue. <laughs> yeah, my favorite thing about that, though, is um, I, I know I get, like, extremely angry at it because I end up incapacitated for most of the fights. But I love the fact that I was a rogue that basically has no health. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, which is cool because um, it focuses on my stealth more than anything else yeah because it forces becomes, you to play a different style than what you're used to well i mean it, it forces me to take the the basic play uh like playing process of a rogue to the nth degree because if i get caught in combat doing what i'm trying to do i'm dead yeah <laughs> so it's it's very interesting and i love that because um but it also allows for some really, really great uh, stuff. Like, one of my favorite things is, for my backstory, I ended up being the Prince of the Elves. Um, and while we were trying to find the key fragments in the Elven capital, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our players was distracting the entire royal guardsmen and 90% of the kingdom in... Uh, in the throne room playing a flaming piano while the rest of us took on a uh, a mound uh, yeah a shambling mound <laughs> yeah which again at this time we are level three or four doing uh, finding a mound <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was we... very interesting because it's like yeah. the the whole music was like reverberating through the kingdom so uh -huh. like even the the mound was like bopping to the the tune of the uh -huh. the music being played yeah so it, it felt like uh i could just envision this you made this 
so well that I could actually see everything that was happening. Was exactly, so cool. and that's that's what I want to to bring. I want to um, for everyone who's not able to play at a table to truly envision everything that's going on in a, in a world because I want it to be like interactive for everyone, not just um, not just the players. I mean, like yes, the players are actually playing the game but like have enough um story and um things written in to where you have a good grasp of what's going on Mm -hmm. um and that's kind of what a a big reason why i'm like reinventing or rewriting um my first campaign of aria because um i mean the base the baseline was like Okay, you wake up at a prison, you have no clue how you get there, and then all of a sudden you teleport through a portal into a cyberpunk-esque world. Yep, where you go farming for materials and throw a golem off a cliff. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's something you um, Heron did in our uh, on our beta tests. Um, <laughs> level, th- were you, were you even level three? I was still level one at that point because you didn't have a leveling system in place. No, yeah, you were level one. I did not know how to work encounters, and you somehow rolled enough nat twenties, and I did not know how to how to play as a enemy, and you rolled enough strength checks to throw a golem off a cliff. Yeah, that was. I should have been obliterated within the first, like, two seconds of that encounter. Yeah, one one hit would have killed you. Yeah. One hit at, like, critically low damage would have killed me. <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts of, um, of Aria when we actually did, like, play it as a campaign was um, your, your character because you came in late yep. in the party, and I kind of came up with a character on the spot for you you were a well no 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 no. because when we were coming back from uh uh when we were coming back from visiting my sister and my uh and my mom we (laughs) that entire car ride back to my play uh back to like our home and everything was uh uh was spent building this character well yeah but the backstory in particular because we got your character made but um, it was like right in the middle of a fight that was going on with the other players. Mm-hmm. So what I had happened was the rest of the party um, fighting basilisks mm-hmm. and you got caught in the crossfire like centuries ago. And so your character was like a very intelligent caveman, essentially. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a, it was around to the point where I was there for the birth of magic in the universe. Yeah, like, and... <laughs> This might be a little bit of spoilers because I might still have this in um, in the campaign when I rewrite it. But um, the the other members of the campaign took over this long abandoned castle, and for the backstory and bringing um, Heron's character into like just to fit in, I set them on a dungeon and um, had uh, made um, Heron's character a wife. That was a royal guard that had long since died and became a banshee. Yep. And so, which we then exercised and then tied her soul to an amulet, so I could talk to her whenever I wanted. That, which now that I say that out loud, is probably worse than just letting her like her soul rest. Yeah, but, it was a very like sad moment though, like yeah. having to fight. Um, Someone that you used to love, mm-hmm. and that's that's more uh, things that I want to like draw out is very emotional um, spots in campaigns that really make you think about what your character is like going through in that moment, and to also make it feel like it's real. Exactly, like, that's that's the... that's the goal of the DM is uh-huh. to make it feel as real as possible. Mm-hmm. So it's it's interesting because the more immersed you get in um, in a campaign and in a session determines not only how well you're doing as a player, but it also is, yeah, it's the goal of the DM, is to just make sure everyone's having fun. And the best way to have fun with D&D, a role-playing game, is to 
make it as close to reality as possible just in another world yeah so yeah that's um at least that's 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 how i view it and you're doing a fantastic job by the way from a player's like perspective i've never had more fun playing D D. yeah from any of your campaigns so i just want to maybe you know play as a player you'll get there eventually because i hard. have i have ideas of very broken characters that i would like to try out eventually <laughs> <laughs> wait uh, <laughs> you're essentially setting me up for a trap is what i'm hearing maybe <laughs> maybe not uh, maybe not like min maxing but uh... uh yes i i i've stated this before in uh a couple of our uh, uh pieces of our content i do want to be a dm eventually um i, I mean you got a little bit of taste with builder myth I did, uh, which was which was cool. So yeah, I mean, eventually, eventually it, it might be a thing. Yeah. But uh, you'll definitely be figureheading our D and D portion of the channel. Yeah, I. It's not like I don't enjoy being a DM. I I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. It's it's it is true. Um. A lot of a lot of time goes into being a DM, but there's something about once all that time is done and being able to share what you've created with your party, it's, it's something that just feels really great to like see the reactions on your players uh, faces just in just to see what they're going through all through what you've created. Now, granted, this isn't for, this isn't set for everyone because I know there are some uh, camp, like some, parties that totally go off the scripts and throw away everything that the dm has made yep. i am very sorry to those D, uh those dms as a player i just want to formally apologize <laughs> because unfortunately i we've gone off the rails of what you've set for campaigns before exactly and, and that's yeah. that's something i even um i accounted for even in the beginning mm-hmm. the way that i make my my campaigns is Yes, I put a lot of detail into my campaigns, and for core bits, I do have um, those those amount of details. But I very loosely write my script. Um, I I put in a lot of room for imp- improv because that's a lot of what you have to do. You don't expect what your players are going to do, so improv is your best bet. Yeah, I mean the- so. The freaking uh, the thieves gauntlet that you put into Azeroth was never on your. <laughs> it was never on your. Well, agenda. not even the witch. <laughs> yeah. Remember the witch? Oh yeah, no, like that was just a like piecemeal thing that happened spur of the moment. Uh, on our second, third, yeah, third session. So for a little bit of insight, um, um, the party that Heron was in went to this little bitty farming village that had a problem with uh some scarecrows. And they got super skeptical of the tavern keep, which I had no intention of doing anything for this tavern keep. It was, it was just a a a young uh, female who happened to run it and know a little bit about what was going on. And they got so suspicious. I was like, you know what? Fine, I'll I'll think of something here. And so after they defeated the scarecrow and everything, they came back to find her completely just missing. Yep. And they they went down a a hidden hatch into the basement we did where some they snooping around and then where we, they uh, found some glowing light and some cackling and they're like, nope, we're so out of here. We, we jetted and uh, yeah, she's she exists. Yep. Will we find her again? Oh Who's yeah, <laughs> you you definitely will even more than once. She's gonna be a returning character like the like the Polter Kitty from Luigi's Mansion Three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Have you even touched Luigi's Mansion Three? Uh, I do not own the game, no. That's unfortunate. I might have to. I might have to let you borrow. Well, I played a little bit of it when you let me borrow it, but not yeah. very much. Yeah, I mean, as like, hit me up, bro. I I'm playing through it right now just because I wanted to play through the game again. But like, seriously, I'm cool dropping it if you if you want to borrow it. <laughs> but uh, I so, guess... um, sorry, it's I'm just bad. getting back on the track of of D and D here. Yeah. Sorry, um, that, that blew up into my brain because I was just like, hey, this is a thing. I can tie this into an analogy. Oh, no, tangent, 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 flash, flash, flash. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so Curse of Strahd is a very different one as well. Uh, that, it's, it, 
it's really true when it says it is one of the most difficult campaigns to to run not only for difficulty of the players but also for the dm to run it um i i really do um suggest uh beginning level dms not to take on this unless you have more experience because even with me doing this for several years consistently i'm still struggling to put everything together there's so much detail and lore that you have to absorb and memorize before you can even start a session i have to pretty much like read hours of chapters and reread them just to understand everything that's going on in this world and then also memorizing the core details of like not only the town that you're in but also the world in itself and the properties of that world because it's set in a completely different plane of existence than normal D&D. Um but yeah, so that's that's uh that's a fun thing and I would say we're about a third of the way in Curse of Strahd right now. Maybe not even that. Um the town right now is just got to Velaki, um, like right on the gate of it. They ran through the death house. They've done stuff with um, Irina and and all that, um, the church, and yeah. So it's been it's been a lot of things. And uh, you wanna you wanna share your experiences with Curse of Strahd here? <laughs> Okay, so session three, we started the Death House? I believe so. Yeah, so um, my character, uh, Mortson Kilgura, uh, I had my uh, my work buddies uh, help me name that one because <laughs> it took me a while. Uh, also, I just want to say this right now. Um, having permission from your DM to write as specific text as you want for your character is one of the coolest things that could happen because I spent, I think, a grand total of five and a half hours writing the backstory for my character. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, it took me a while. I took a lot of inspiration. I took uh, inspiration from uh, from Avatar with the Na'vi. I took inspiration from, uh, from Majora's Mask, Legend of Zelda. I took inspiration from a lot of those things uh, to build this character and ended up being a water genasi who... Uh, was able to uh, cast. Uh, I, sorry, he was a he was a druid <laughs> as well, and he was able to cast lightning magic, <laughs> being a water genasi. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I encourage um, backstories and like as much detail as possible because not only does that give you a better um, understanding of your character, but it also allows me as a DM to better incorporate that character into the campaign. Which is cool because it allows. Um, it allows uh, a little tiny bit of homebrewing uh, into uh, uh, into written campaigns and methodically written campaigns like Curse of Strahd because mm-hmm. having a druid being able to ca- – I forget what the spell is called exactly, but being able to use any kind of lightning magic is kind of absurd. <laughs> <laughs> but it works really well, and it's cool that it does. Yeah. Um, I also love the uh, – uh, but yeah, no, getting into it. So when we got into – uh, the death house uh, we we decided to do uh, the dungeon a little bit backwards uh, because instead of exploring it room by room we gunned to the top of the uh, the mansion and then started going room by room yeah that that, that made that made <laughs> that made a DM very upset there <laughs> uh, but yeah so in the death house there are these two what, what are they? What do you mean? Like, uh, there are these two characters that kind of, kind of, are your companions throughout the Death House. Well, yes and no. Yeah. The way that you specifically did it, it was not supposed to be that way. No, but uh, but it ended um, up working. Pretty much, <laughs> the way that they did it was um, uh, sorry, spoilers for anyone who um has not played Curse of Strahd yet. So um, if if you are wanting to play it or um, are currently going through it, I would recommend kind of skipping over this part. But um, pretty much they went up to the first floor and broke a lock on the first floor to enter um, the children's room. Fourth floor. Uh, 
yeah, the fourth floor, um, <laughs> of Rose and Thorn, which are the children that uh, you encounter um, that pretty much guide you into the death house. Mm-hmm. And pretty much being that uh, one of the first rooms that you guys went in. Um, was not supposed to be accessed until you'd been in the dungeon for a little while. <laughs> yeah. And pretty much um, in the book, it states that uh, people that try to leave the room, um, Rose and Thorn, will pretty much possess or try to possess the characters. Yep. And that's exactly what happened with two of our characters. And they did not try to or even think to persuade them out of their bodies. They just kind of accepted their fate and went through the death house being possessed by a little boy. <laughs> yes, you were you were possessed by Thorn. Yep, <laughs> that was that was a challenging thing as a player because uh, not only that because I am uh, I am an actor, uh, <laughs> so I had to. Th- that was a challenging even having years of experience like actually acting as well. It uh, <laughs> because I had to go. It felt like I was playing a character based on Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> uh just like as far as uh uh what is it uh, as far as contrasting personalities went because my uh my water genasi uh Mortson was kind of kind of the leader of the party and throughout the death house I had to take a step back because uh every 2 seconds Thord was crying. <laughs> yes, because of your your new flaw which is you're scared of everything. Exactly. And uh so that <laughs> uh as we went through the death house, uh, there were uh, there there are multiple like ghasts and just undead enemies that take uh, that take the shape of uh, of certain things like astral stuff as well uh, that uh, which allows uh, which allows uh, inanimate objects to to be possessed and used against you. So when you go into a uh, <laughs> when you go into a maid keep. Uh, and you go into a broom closet, the last thing you expect is the uh, the broom to then be possessed, and then you rolling multiple nat ones in a row to the point where your character now has an irrational fear of brooms and screams bloody murder anytime he sees one. Yep, and that <laughs> is, in fact, retained after you were not possessed. Yep, so my character now is just absolutely terrified of brooms. Yeah. So... Even to the point now where if there is a broom anywhere near me as a character, I go into the fetal position and just start screaming and crying violently. <laughs> Which I found was amazing and also something you would never expect playing D&D. Nope. Yeah, that was a thing that just happened, and it was it's still hilarious. I laugh anytime, but it's funny because it's, uh, from a player perspective... Now I have to think very methodically about, uh, and very I have to be very conscien- conscientious, uh, con- conscientious. I can say that word, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of just natural things because you wouldn't think having a broom just laying out in a tavern would be a problem, but unfortunately, if Morton sees it, <laughs> a scene is bound to occur. <laughs> yes, that's one of the very many things. Um... That has happened in our D and D experiences. Another one um, is um, was run by um, our f- a friend of ours, mm-hmm. and was one of the only times that I actually really got to play as a uh, a player. Yep. So- and it was not an official D and D campaign. This was um, written by I can't I can't remember who made it, but it was a very ooey Christmas. It was a Christmas campaign. Mm-hmm. And I had um, had made a character called Oof, which, which... was uh, for a little bit of background context. Uh, back when we were in high school, there was uh, one of our uh, one of our uh, one of our friends uh, had long hair, uh, and he was a very very tall guy, a very tall muscular guy, and he uh, he he had one of the uh, one of the the basic beanies that you see kind of flying around the place right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so he threw that on, uh, much like uh, much like your your stereotypical gnome garb, uh, where you have uh, just the nose and the beard. Uh, I want to see uh, if I can hat. get uh, 
permission from him because I want to I want to like pop the picture up. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, hilarious. I, I still have the photo and every time I see it, I just laugh because uh, he took so he took his hair and tied it around his chin with a hair tie to make himself like a beard. <laughs> and uh, he ended up being uh, our choir mascot. Yeah, for his, the his name was Ulf the Choir Gnome. Ulf the Choir Gnome. And uh, he would even go to the point where because uh, our, our friend that did this uh, was uh, was a choral council member and he was in charge of uh uh, he was the representative for uh, our advanced mixed choir. So every time uh, he would put a reminder in the chat, hey, review your lines. Hey, uh, practice these pieces. Hey, uh, do certain things. Hey, don't forget, this is what happened. He would always per, uh, personify himself as Wolf the Choir Gnome. So that was, <laughs> it added a little bit of fun to, to, a, little, uh, to a different piece of job, uh, which was really cool. He's a really great guy too. Yeah, so that, that was the inspiration of my... Uh my gnome who I decided to play art uh, artificer or mm -hmm. artificer, however you want to pronounce it. I, I call it artificer. Yep. Um, and it was because I, I never played an artificer before and I wanted to see how it worked. Yep. Um, and, uh, I decided to, uh, to, <laughs> I convinced you to not choose a, a rogue. Yes. This was one of the very few times at this point in my, uh, my D and D career of not playing a rogue. What, what, what did I play? I was a barbarian. You were a Goliath barbarian. Yes, uh, which was a very different form of combat than I was used to. <laughs> yeah, especially since you had a very low intelligence score. Yep, so uh, it basically ended up turning... Uh, we, we decided to homebrew the ever-loving crap out of this campaign. Yes. Which was hilarious because it... Uh, it allowed for some very unconstitutional moments that if an experienced DM saw labeled as D&D, &D, they would probably die from. Yeah, this is not something that would be allowed in a normal campaign. Oh, absolutely not. There are so... In order to do something... This... In order to do something like this in an actual campaign, there are so many layers that you would have to explore. <laughs> and even then, it wouldn't be funny at that point. Yeah, so... so... <laughs> let me let me pull up, because I have notes about this on my phone. <laughs> yeah, so it, it started off all well and good, just, just doing our normal stuff. I, I had the ability to create magical objects that I could use as, like, a cannon, and yep. you had your axes, and then it turned into you throwing me as your axes, and then me getting fire resistance, and then setting me on fire as a throwing axe, and then... Being able to... And then turning my, uh... And then you having enough strength to hold on to my axes so I could tie you to the end of the rope so I could use you as a human Beyblade. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, all that turned into something called gnome damage. Which was a mechanic that was made on the spot. <laughs> so pretty much anything that was used with my character added an additional D4, D6, and I think even later to, to a D8 of additional damage called gnome damage that yep, we would so add on to our, our already broken attacks. Yeah, so it was uh, because... Instead of uh, being, <laughs> instead of fire causing damage to you or the environment, it only caused the damage to the enemies. Uh, and then I think like one point of damage to me. And there was sl and then there was slashing damage because of the axes. There was bludgeoning damage because I was literally throwing a gnome at you. <laughs> uh, and or at least Utnar was, which was the uh, the name of my character. Decided to throw in a little bit of Norse into that point because I was very into Norse. I still am very into Norse mythology <laughs> um, because it's, it's very entertaining and it's very, very cool. Yeah. But um, I, at least I, I have the same fascination with Norse mythology that I, do, that most people do with like Greek mythology or Roman mythology and stuff like that. So, which I still find entertaining, but I like Norse because Vikings. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I, before I get sidetracked on my love of North Pisol uh, Norse mythology, <laughs> I, yeah, no, we, we had this built-in mechanic that leveled up as we, as we went through to the point where uh, we ended up getting a 1d10 of gnome damage by the end of it, uh, which the funny thing is we still have all those mechanics in play, so if we ever want to pick that up again, we can. So it's, it's Which would be hilarious. amazing. Yeah. Um, 
but I'll just give you some uh, some ideas. We decided to to play the the act of uh, creating magical objects into a different. <laughs> we took it a little too far because we ended up turning my axes when you combined them. Uh, into a magical frying pan, <laughs> a magical giant frying pan. I forgot about that. Um, which we then created a fireproof rope that we attached to you and the frying pan and made like one of those like uh, like whack paddle things. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> oh, turn me into a freaking ping like a. Uh... Yeah, the, like little pong things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like uh, <laughs> which we we called sling pod, and how it worked was uh, we had all the damage uh, as usual. The only difference is we didn't have slashing damage, so bludgeoning uh, ended up just being more powerful because of the uh, because of how fast you ended up being. So Utnar would quite literally uh, bounce you back and forth against the. Uh, against the metal frying pan multiple times, building up enough speed to the point where you literally just launched at enemies <laughs> like a bullet. <laughs> yeah, and this, this is was... why I cannot be a player. Yep, because uh, this is what happens. <laughs> That's, that was probably one of the best like experiences with D&D I've ever had, though. Oh, it was just so funny. And we weren't taking it seriously at all, and neither was the DM, and they were having just as much fun as we were, which is, it's just the name of the game at the end of the exactly. day. Exactly. Like it's, it's all about having fun and making your own rules. Exactly. So, um, but going a little bit more in depth with player versus, uh, player versus DM, uh, the DM has, has full domain, uh, <laughs> allowance to basically do whatever they want. Yeah. Uh, at any point, which is uh, which is really cool because it allows uh, it allows you just to get immersed into a world as a player. Or if something happened in real life that the DM wants to uh, wants to beat the crap out of you for in game, they can. And I guess has taken advantage of that before. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. What do you what you, you've already gone into some of the challenges as a DM. But not player specific problems. Well, I can say something that's kind of a disadvantage for a DM and also an advantage for um, a player. Um, and this is why. Um, let me let me bring a little bit more context into this. Um, my very first campaign, I played as a character alongside um, the party, um, just to kind of help them out. And because we had a very small party, I wanted to kind of give them some help as well. And playing through that it it made me realize how difficult it was to really play as a character because and like make it my character feel like a player instead of an npc because it always felt like i just had written stuff out for my character like because i always knew what was going to happen mm -hmm. and so bringing that forward it's it's that that gift of the player never knowing what's going to happen and the the DM is essentially in charge. Like he's the person that makes the world. He knows what's going to happen. Yep. And so it's a very different um, take whenever you're playing as a player, because it, it gets rid of that. I don't know what's going to happen next because I do know what's happening, happening next. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's each breed, like each side of, of D and D has its benefits and it has its disadvantages. Yeah. Uh, because my I've never experienced um, I've never <laughs> I've never done anything DM related, and it's uh, it's something of mine that I will eventually pursue because I want to give you that experience as a player. <laughs> yeah. That uh, because it's I don't know you get to have you get to let your mind just wander when you're a player as opposed to being a DM who has to methodically write out everything to make sure your players can have fun. Yeah. So it's, um, it's interesting. It's like being a game designer, <laughs> which eventually I would like to be. Oh, I, I'm the same way. Like, I am currently going to school for programming to maybe eventually make my own game. So, yeah, I mean, we've already, uh, you've done some basic coding to have uh, to have ideas and you've shown me some of your ideas which I think are really really cool and I honestly think they could be as popular as Super Meat Boy one day <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know about that but uh... <laughs> um, but yeah no it's it's interesting um, one of my favorite things as a player is 
the fact that um, you don't know what equipment is yours from the get-go. You don't know who your character is, and you get to kind of explore your character as you as you go um, with uh, their different experiences because you you essentially get to it unfold the story uh, every time you play, and you just get to you get to read the next chapter. It's like reading a book. And you know me, I'm a bookworm, so yeah, I that that's kind of like I that's kind of like I like it's it, that's uh, exactly what D and D is essentially. It's the book writer versus the reader. Exactly. So uh, I don't know. It, it's kind of interesting. Um, but what's your? I guess what what would you say you have to say is your absolute favorite part about being a DM? Definitely the. It's. This is me personally because I have more experience with um writing campaigns than actually like doing pre-written ones curse of strahd is well i wouldn't say the first one because i tried uh dragons of stormwork isle before and we didn't go very far into that but um curse of strahd is pretty much the first pre-written story that um us as a party has like really gone through um so it's definitely um the the emotion of it like it's it's the satisfaction you get whenever um, to see your 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 characters make like a big breakthrough or like have a big impactful event happen. It's it's just like you build up all this suspense, you build up all this um, this story um, to this one moment, and you want your characters, you want to see your characters. Um, like reaction to it um so yeah sorry about that sorry uh irl plans uh after we're done with recording (laughs) um but yeah no it's i lost all train of thought (laughs) i i pretty much like yeah it's the satisfaction that i i get seeing um, all the suspense um, brought out into one one interaction. It's mm-hmm. like what you guys take of the story I create. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, as any, I feel like as any developer or any writer or any author would tell would say the exact same thing. Like you got immersed in my story, booyah. Yeah, <laughs> and another thing that I really love about DMing is getting immersed in your own story because <laughs> you you start off with this basic idea of like what you want to do but it's not really until you start really putting detail into it then your mind starts to wonder of like all these different things that you can add in and like what you want your your story to go just let your and creative outlet exact, flow <laughs> exactly and you end up getting some really cool ideas to put into your campaign that just makes it entirely unique and makes your players go, whoa, you know, like, I mean, you, you've had some of those experiences like that, that (laughs) why, why are you looking at me like that? Your eyes are like very wide. Cause I was remembering, um, a couple of different experiences with that. Like, uh, I, I still, it's become a core memory with D and D for me now. Um, when you revealed the mound, in the elven capital <laughs> just because of how terrified i was at that point because i had fought a mound before in like one of my very very first campaigns and i was just like oh no <laughs> yeah which was hilarious to watch because we were playing with um we were playing with uh some newcomers to D uh when that happened which was which was really awesome uh let's see here like sorry my brain my brain my brain my brain my brain <laughs> Uh, anyway, as you were yeah. saying, you were talking about the the Shambly Mound. Yes, I was. Uh, I was shocked that you threw one of those in so early into a campaign. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's like I have a general understanding of where you guys are at mm-hmm. uh, versus what I throw in because I have a general idea of like what I would like in terms of the type of monster and like mm-hmm. what I want the feel to be, but I'm not gonna give you something that's going to be like overly like powerful either. Mm-hmm. And, um, like, something that I know you can handle based, of, based off of your experiences. And even if a enemy is too difficult based off of, like, CR and stuff, I always tweak it to where it's set to be um, your, like, your type, like, 
in your range mm -hmm. because um, in in Tower of Azeroth, um, the second boss that you you fought, um, I I really wish I could uh, reveal more about this, and I'm probably just gonna have an entire podcast <laughs> to um, I explaining uh, Tower of Azeroth um, because it's it's a very unique and amazing campaign that I made and you guys are enjoying it. So yeah, it's one of those things where it was, uh, when I was getting th like thrown at work, um, because we, we started tower of Azeroth when, uh, when I was, uh, when I was working two jobs. So, uh, my brain was dead, <laughs> uh, 90% of the week. And, uh, when, uh, when the day came around where it was just like, oh, it's time for Tower of Azeroth. I can actually have fun. Yeah. <laughs> and it proved to be that way because d and is a very fantastic game. And if you're a fan of fantasy at all, or um, honestly, uh, because of the cyberpunk ailment that you can throw into, uh, that you can throw at d and you can have uh, campaigns that are based around uh, like outer space and like galactic empires and stuff like that, which yeah. are really, really cool, which I would love to do something like that eventually. Um, you can do, um, you can do a, a campaign themed about pirates. You can do a campaign, uh, based on you trying to save, uh, uh, trying to save an orc, uh, orphanage and then, uh, ruining an orc's, uh, birthday party. <laughs> Sorry, that was a weird campaign. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, getting back to it, like the second boss of Tower of Azeroth, you fought a stone golem, yep, which, which was, was cool. a CR eight, yep. which is much stronger than what you guys should be fighting at your level four characters. Yep. And so what I did was I, I, I did some, a little bit of tweaking to it to where I used a different stat block, but used the same moves, um, that a stone golem would. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so that, that dimmed down the, the intensity to still make it a difficult, boss fight for you but something that you could easily overcome yeah um so yeah so that's pretty much what i'm getting at with that mm -hmm. um is there anything else um well what else can i talk about here i think what was your favorite moment of tower of azeroth um at, up to this point hmm uh well definitely the uh the witch that was that was a funny moment mm -hmm. um maybe um the entire fact of the whole uh your mother thinking uh you were your dad yep which was the uh <laughs> which was the leader of the thieves guild that yeah. You, that I so so as I prison. so as I said, like very very soon I will be making a podcast, uh, going into depth of, uh, Tower of Azeroth as it stands right now because uh, the party is um very close to finishing the first floor, mm -hmm. um, and as soon as that's done, I have a lot of room to talk about and go into detail pretty much um from beginning until current. Yeah, I mean, the, the most current thing that happened was the fact that uh, I, I suffered a blow to the head and it made me a little stupid, <laughs> which was not a good thing for a rogue to be in in this next area. <laughs> yeah. So now I have to think about being, like, uh, chaotically ditzy while also maintaining my functionality as a rogue. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, little things like that that allow you to have... Uh, I'll already have more fun as a player in uh, in D and D. So take your acting to the extreme, take your role playing to the extreme when you're playing D and D, because at the end of the day, it just makes it more fun. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Can you think of anything else we need to talk about? I think we touched on all of our topics for once. Yeah. So as I said before, like this is this is something that I I really want to bring um into. Uh, something for Ember's Corner, and I would absolutely love to do um, in-person campaigns, uh, having like 3D model sets and things like that. But unfortunately, like I can't always guarantee that um, me and my party is going to be able to like 
show up in one space all the time. <laughs> At least not not now. They were uh, doing pretty the, consistently with Tower of Azeroth for like a month or two. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, always something always ends up happening, and life happens, and you gotta work around it. And until um we really become like bigger, I guess, in a, in a sense of like our channel and stuff, and we actually are able to really set time aside to do these things every week or maybe even twice a week. Um, it's just something that's not feasible because I, I mean, for me, I'd have to have a room and a table and I, I would like to get a 3d printer Mm -hmm. that would eventually, uh, bring all this into like into a space. However, I would say probably by this um, beginning of next year, I would be ready to do a virtual campaign. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've been getting very, very familiar with how Roll20 works and everything. Mm-hmm. So the way that I would like to do a virtual campaign is not necessarily having webcams of our characters, but having um, custom art of our our player characters as like who we're talking through. So like you would, um, it, when you're speaking, it's going to be your character and whoever else is speaking and then having, um, the main stream switching through maybe, um, art of what the scenery might look like and the, the, the maps and the battle maps and everything like that and kind of make it more, um, of an experience for our viewers as well. Because that's something um, right now, personally, I'm, I'm a little scared of is the fact that I'm still a new DM and I, I want it to be enjoyable for our audience just as much as it is for the players. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, there's going to be struggles, it's going to happen, but that's something you guys can look forward to. D&D is still a very big part of our lives because we still try to dedicate one day a week to playing it. So it's it's a, it's a thing that I love and it's something that uh, a lot of new people are getting into nowadays because of Stranger Things and stuff like that. So it's I think it's really, really cool that D&D is getting a resurgence yeah. <laughs> in culture, which is, it needs to be. It's a fantastic game. And it's a fantastic concept that you can have as much freedom with as you want. That's because, like, as we said, um, with uh, with Ulf and Utnar, uh, that everything there, we decided to just forego all of the rules of D&D and um, play a game that was just fun. Yeah, because I, I do get it. Like, this is, for a lot of people, this is a very... Um controversial thing with uh D and especially like religious people um because me and dom are um are are christians yep and we we don't try to push that on people like nope. this is that we would like this to be a christian channel but at the same time this is free for everyone um to to be here and to this we want this to be a safe space for everyone we're it's all inclusive y'all we're not gonna like just because you're living a lifestyle that we don't agree with doesn't mean we're going to turn you away from our content. Exactly. Like, and that's not cool and nobody should ever do that. <laughs> exactly. Like this this is a place for everyone to be welcome and not to be judged on who they look like, what they believe in or whatever may be going on in the world um right now. Mm-hmm. Um and with with that being said, like the re- religious side of of D&D like we we get it but at the same time it's not in the way that people would think it is in nope. it baselines down to a person telling a story and then the others um playing through that story exactly like at the end of the day you're just playing a game yeah now i could definitely see like things like if things would get out of hand then maybe but like that would have to go like extremely out of hand mm-hmm. and like out of the like way out there yeah and discerning con- like being conscientious of of uh things that are in dungeons and dragons if you want to avoid that because you're not comfortable with it that's fine but you need to discuss that with your dm because 
Um, it's, uh, I mean, like there's necromancy elements that you can play with in D and D that uh, a lot of people avoid because of that reason and stuff like that. And uh, there's the whole point of uh, being a paladin where you have to have, uh, we have to have certain things. But I mean, um, it's interesting because well, you can be as vague or as specific as you want with D and D, like. You can go into all this detail about having certain um, ingredients and like saying all this sites and and stuff for spells to be cast and stuff like that. Or you can be like, I cast fireball. And then you do. <laughs> you don't have to. It doesn't have to be. It's only as bad as you let it be. Exactly. So and at I, the end of the day, you you control it. So if you control something, then <laughs> if you control something, how is it necessarily bad? Exactly. Like nothing is inherently bad. It's what you do with it that makes it bad. I, I shouldn't say nothing is inherently bad, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It's so it's it, it's funky. So if you if you want to discuss that, um, please do because it's. Uh, it's something that needs to be talked about because D&D can be a game where you just have fun. I personally know hundreds of Christians that play D&D because, um, because it's a fun game and literally nothing else, uh, like nothing tied to it. Yeah. And, and we're not, and we're not just speaking for Christians. Like there are other, there's a lot of different people who have different beliefs and like what they think. And there's uh, a lot of people that and what they yeah. more so what they perceive D D to be in their own eyes so. exactly so i mean D D, like christianity versus D D, as unfortunately it is a controversial issue but um at the end of the day it's just a game that yeah. you can stop playing whenever you want to so take that as you will <laughs> yeah and with that i believe we are all out of time yes we are well uh Thank you for listening to our uh, to our D and D podcast, and thank you for listening to Gygus ramble on about how much he loves being a DM. <laughs> yeah, it was my time to shine this time. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, it's okay. Uh, I'll make a podcast about gushing about winter for another day. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope you guys all enjoyed uh, us talking about this, and uh, they got a little serious at the end. We apologize for that, but at the end of the day, it, you, at the end of the day. It, it, You're free to have your own opinions. Exactly, and we're not going to discriminate you because because you have different opinions. We we celebrate differences yeah. in our world because it's what makes a lot of things great at the end of the day. So yeah. So if you guys really uh, enjoy this, uh, please let us know. Uh, if there's any ideas or anything you would like us to talk about, please uh, let us know either uh, either in Twitch yep. or uh, on YouTube, uh, youtube.com uh, at Ember's Corner. Um, we will be. Uh, we would try to upload podcasts every Saturday, so. Yep, we apologize for the uh, uh, for no episode four. Um, we ran into a lot of issues with our most previous podcast, or our uh, the podcast we recorded before our most previous one that uh, we eventually decided to just ultimately take down. And it's stuff we will discuss eventually, but as of right now, there's things in it that we cannot discuss uh, in terms of privacy and safety reasons. Exactly. Uh, there are a lot of corporations involved with uh, with those topics that we uh, we prematurely talked about without considering, and that's why ultimately we decided to take, to take it down. Um, so, for those of you that listened to that podcast, uh, I apologize, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's something that we we just can't talk about at the moment. So please respect us with that. Uh, without further ado. Um, That'll be the end of this episode of Campfire Embers. Thank you so much for listening to us talk about D&D. And please tell us uh, what you want us to expand on. Please tell us what you want us to talk about. We're always looking for more input and other things like that. So, yeah, tune in in about 5, 10 minutes to uh, to us returning to the land of Mario Wonder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, have a good day, guys. Uh, we'll see you le- next time. <laughs>